Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. This is probably my favorite session of all of Phil Singapore because the heart of our ecosystem really comes to the startups that make up it. And the people that we have on this panel are really seeding the fruit of the Filecoin ecosystem. There's so many amazing startups have graduated from each of these programs, um, from Long Hash to Outlier Ventures to the Protocol Labs Network and all the companies that um, Protocol Labs has invested in over the last few years. So first off, I wanted everyone here to introduce themselves. What brought you guys into Web3? Um, I know that Coco, you used to work in the Web2 space and actually ride sharing, so a very different space. Um, Emma, I know that you were spent a lot of time in management consulting. And Brad, I know you spent some time in the cloud side on AWS. What led you to the forces of Filecoin? So why don't we start with you, Coco? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Coco. I'm actually in the um, investor relations team in Outlier Ventures. What I am do currently is connecting our portfolio companies to the VCs to understand what the investor net, uh, appetite is right now. Um, and previously, I was actually working in Uber, a Web2 company. And then what brought me into crypto is because Uber is almost like a decentralized driver platform, I would say, but in a centralized way. So I'm really interested in crypto and see how we can change the narrative and then benefit uh, more people in that way. And, and yeah. <laughs> Amazing. What about you, Emma? Well, thanks for having me here. So, um, um, hi guys, I'm uh, Emma. I'm the CEO uh, for Long Hash Ventures. So, uh, we're, we're, I think, one of the first uh, Web3 accelerators in Asia. Uh, and I think we're also one of the first kind of go-to accelerator partner for Filecoin. So, really excited to be uh, supporting the Filecoin ecosystem from the very beginning. So, we have a accelerator. We also have a VC fund focused on Web3. Um, and uh, before this, I was a management consultant at McKinsey for three years. Before that, I was a banker. So um, slowly but gradually, once I came into the crypto rabbit hole, really, there's no way to go back to TradeFi. So super excited to be here. And Brad, you're up next. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I'm Brad Holden. I lead the investment team at Protocol Labs, and it's awesome for me to be up here with two of our favorite accelerator partners. You know, the accelerator program is a great way for us to to empower the next generation of Web3 builders uh, building in our ecosystem. From the Protocol Lab side, I think we have invested in over 150 companies in the last couple of years and have 175 companies coming through the accelerator program. Uh, personally, I spent seven years as an investor at Tomorrow Ventures, which is part of Eric Schmidt's fund. And then, as Clara mentioned, I went over to the dark side at AWS. Uh, and then basically, like, was doing a lot of personal reading and investing in crypto and kind of got red-pilled and realized, you know, I wanted to be part of the future. So here I am. Amazing. Well, I wanted to go back around Robin and have everyone talk a little bit more about your ventures, your investments, um, what does each of your programs do, and why Filecoin? And so um, I'm going to start with you, Coco. I know that Outliers has looked at the open metaverse. I mean, if you can define that term for the audience, but also explain a little bit more why since 2014, Outliers has been thinking about the open metaverse mm -hmm. even before the bull market and the bear market we're in, yeah. um, why you guys are bullish on that, and then a little bit more about um, the partnership you guys have with the Filecoin ecosystem. Yep, sure. Um, I'll give an overview of what Outlier Ventures do first. So Outlier Ventures, we have been running accelerator programs since 2014, and we've been accelerating more than 180 companies uh, so far to this day. Um, so long history. And then for Open Metaverse Thesis, it's really about bringing everything uh, in the Web3 world interconnected because we feel like it's a very fragmented space and we really need to have an open metaverse to have everyone come on board instead of every single person working individually in, in an isolated space. And yeah, uh, we're really happy to partner with Filecoin. Uh, to, so previously, we did run two program with uh, Filecoin and Protocol Labs. Uh, it was more of our Filecoin base camp. And then next week, we are actually kickstarting our new IPFS Open Metaverse base camp. Um, and the reason why we're separating Filecoin and IPFS is because we see there are two types of builders. One type is focusing more on the data infrastructure and data economy, facilitating the speed and accessibility of data. On the other side, on the Open Metaverse IPFS program, it's really utilizing IPFS as a tool for NFT tooling, for DAOs, for um, a lot of like social fight uh, that we are hearing. 
So yeah, we're really excited to partner with Filecoin to understand uh, to accelerate more company in this ecosystem. Amazing. And then Emma, we know that you have been involved in the Web3 space for so long with Longhash. You guys are one of the earliest um, groups in the Asia market, especially, to be bullish on this. So what led you um, to think about that so early on? And then second, why Filecoin? Um, so tell us more about your programs with us. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been all in Web3 since 2018. Um, I think Web3, as opposed to Web2 and Web1, is really about uh, open, transparent, permissionless, privacy, you know, user-owned uh, assets and everything. So, um, so I think Filecoin, as one of the most important players in the decentralized storage, is a very important key infrastructure of the whole uh, decentralized Web3 stack. That's why I think we were super uh, excited about the Filecoin ecosystem and wanted to invest into this ecosystem uh, since the very beginning. So for our programs, we've, uh, we've been running this since 2018. So we've accelerated more than 50 projects. And uh, within Filecoin ecosystem, we've accelerated I think more than 20 projects so far and with 10 projects actually working progress. So some of you might get to meet the um, accelerator projects this week. And uh, some of the projects we're really proud of are uh, Lighthouse, which is one of the permanent storage player in the space and lead protocol, decentralized access network. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, just a little bit on the parameters of the program. So the program runs for three weeks. Uh, and we recruit 10 projects every batch. We put in 200K for a certain percentage of, of ownership of the, of the projects. And we help them with refining the pitch, finding product market fit, uh, especially with go-to-market in Asia. Um, and especially um, at the end of the accelerator with curating of their cap table as well. Amazing. And Brad, um, I'm going to turn it to you to cover a few other accelerators that the Filecoin Network has <coughs> been participants of. Um, will you elaborate on Tachyon and Techstars, which I know is cooking up their next cohort of um, applications. Um, so tell us more about some of the exciting things <coughs> happening there. Sure. I mean, for us broadly, I think Colin kind of touched on this, but it's really important for us to grow the ecosystem. So we've built out what we call the builder's funnel. We start with hackathons to expose people to our technology. We do grants to help them turn those you know, ideas into projects. And then we partner with seven or eight accelerators to help those companies turn into fundable, venture-backable operations and protocols. And so, you know, obviously Longhash is an exciting one, Outlier, we partner with Tachyon, Techstars. And I, Juan mentioned it, but later today we're gonna have Phil.vc, which is a demo day of about 25 companies, many of whom have come through the accelerator partnerships. Lighthouse will be pitching from there, Glitter from Outlier. Um, from Tachyon, we have Bona, which is kind of building an open metaverse. They've raised $15 million in an oversubscribed Series A. And so for us, it's super important to partner with great teams like Longhash and Outlier to help accelerate these companies, provide mentorship, strategy, and build all of the feature sets out that Filecoin and our broader ecosystem need. Incredible. Well, Brad, can you tell us a little bit more about Phil.vc? I know that some people might know it, some people don't know it, but how can people get involved with the general VC ecosystem? Sure. So you can go on Phil.vc and request an invite, I think up until <laughs> maybe 45 minutes from now or so, so act quickly. Uh, we have over 375 investors from across the globe who have registered to come see. The companies will be giving three-minute pitches, um, kind of three to five slides. It's modeled after YC Demo Day. We have companies from pre-seed, like Pollinations, who went through the most recent outlier batch, all the way up through Series B, like Fleek and Shingari. So it's a great way to see the breadth of the Protocol Labs network and the Filecoin IPFS ecosystem. Amazing. Well, I'm going to turn it back to Coco. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about some of the startups that you're most excited about in Web3. Mm -hmm. um, what has been on the trend here in Asia? What has been really exciting for you guys? Um, it could be part of the Filecoin IPFS portfolio. It could be broader. But mm -hmm. tell us, audience, mm -hmm. what, what you're most excited about. Um, for our IPFS cohort that's kickstarting next week, my legal team, our legal team tell us not to say anything about it, to keep it a little mysterious because they're still in a finalization process. But um, I can talk about companies that we worked with in the previous Filecoin cohorts that we are really excited about, and they're also here today and pitching at the file VC. Um, first, it's like we have Glitter from our first cohort. Glitter is a data indexing protocol. 
And it's actually a very interesting story how we come across this because uh, when Ted submitted his uh, application, didn't mean to really do uh, a data indexing protocol. It's more of an RSS reader, but then we feel like this, it's hard to find a good uh, product market fit for it. Doesn't really make sense commercially. It's really hard to make sense commercially and have a bit viable business model. So with a little bit of help from Protocol Lab, uh, we help them pivot and to make it into a data indexing protocol, which turns out to be one of the best play, I think, in that cohort. And then also with Pollination, that's what we'll also be pitching later today at the File VC. Um, really cool artists from Berlin, really exciting uh, to work with them because they are a bunch of artists that just come together even when they're applying. They didn't have an entity set up, they didn't have salary, but they're already having a lot of uh, monthly active user, which is super impressive. Um, and so we bring them in, and then now they are building a dream machine that keep, um, keep it free for the community, and they were further on building on more things, such as like a 3D object uh, generator, and then they are also having like really exciting partnership with hotels, with festivals. So yeah, these are the projects that I think really impressive in the previous cohorts, and really excited to work more closely with them. Amazing. What about you, Emma? I know you mentioned Lighthouse earlier. Are there other startups you're especially excited about or even emerging trends that you've seen since 2018? What's been happening since 2018? What's been new and exciting right now out of what you're doing out at yeah. Long Yeah, I, I think it's so hard to pick favorites. We've, we love them all. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, different projects probably progress at different uh, speed. So a few projects that have gained uh, massive traction, I think one of the example uh, is Lead Protocol, which is a decentralized access network. They had a partnership with uh, uh, Shopify to allow for token-gated access and various other on-chain, off-chain use cases. Um, and, and I think Lighthouse, which allows for permanent storage in the, in the Falcon ecosystem. There's also a board, um, which was part of our cohort too, which was acquired by Nansen, um, which is a DeFi aggregator. And in the current batch, there's a couple of really interesting ones as well. So OK Contract deploys, uh, helps companies to deploy widgets um, and a no-code environment. So you're able to kind of bring in the plugins of like, uh, um, um, uh, uh, you know, exchange AMM into whatever um, front face you're, you're building. So that was super, super interesting. And Portrait, decentralized website builder. So there's a lot of interesting uh, projects popping out in the Falcon ecosystem. And aside from that, we also put capital into, I think, Mona, which uh, um, um, Brad talked about, which we're super bullish on as well. Um, and I think to your second point, what's happening in Asia? Um, uh, we're extremely bullish in Asia um, because Asia has such a massive user base, and we're particularly bullish in the application layer in Asia. Because um, you look at GameFi breakouts, you know, Axie came out from Vietnam, right? You look at uh, um, uh, uh, another GameFi project, Steppen, which came out from China, Australia. So I think Asia has a lot of advantage to attract the developers, and especially after the last bull run, there's really been a very convincing trend for Web2 talents from big companies like X Facebook, X Uber. Um, ex, uh, you know, fan to come into the space. So we're extremely excited and we want to leverage the program to provide as much su support as we can to all those talents. Terrific. Yeah. And Brad, I'll turn it to you. I, I know you've seen obviously a lot of startups in your last um, year or so in Web3 and more, but what are some areas that you are most excited about out of um, the Filecoin Protocol Labs investments? And then second, what is unique about those, especially in Asia? Have there been startups that f have found Mar Asia to be that market that they want to play in? <clears throat> sure. I mean, as Emma said, it's hard to pick your favorite children, you know, but uh, we love all of them equally. I think, you know, you kind of, you saw Juan's master plan for Filecoin, you know, which is, you know, build the largest de decentralized storage network, store useful data, and then step three is layer compute over that data. So we spent a lot of time looking at how can we make the data that's stored on Filecoin more actionable? And so compute over data companies like Fluence, which I think is doing a side event later today, uh, Philmine, which is pitching at phil.vc, and a lot, of, and then also broadly, you, you know, the view that there's a lot of public data available on the blockchain, but is not super actionable. It's not easy to process or analyze. So we've looked at a lot of companies that kind of make that data more actionable, allow people to developers to use it and build on top of it. 
Um, and Fluence is a great example of that. No, that's wonderful. Um, so earlier in the hallway before the session started, we were talking about the bear and bull market. And it's such an interesting um, comparison, especially in, in startup ecosystem. Um, I would love to hear from each of you guys what that experience has been like. We obviously were in a bull market for so many years. What has been really interesting about startups that survive? Um, what are the key characteristics that this audience should know that w really will help a startup thrive um, no matter what kind of market we're in? And then also, if you guys want to answer, what's the craziest idea you heard in the, in the bull market cycle that yeah. you, you never thought you would encounter? Yeah. Um, so I think the key characteristics for startup to thrive, even in a bear market first, it's a founder and a team keeping an open mind. Because for the example, all the portfolio companies that uh, we invested in that I talked about, all of them actually pivot. They didn't have the same, they don't have the same idea as they did. Um, so I think having an open mind and not be so fixated on the original idea, but adapt to the market, adapt to see what is new, what is going on, what is the new trend, or what is the new um, technology that can be utilized and then help the ecosystem grow better or help their project to be better. Um, first, I think that is very important to keep an open mind and also just be resilient because in a bear market, Every day we see that actually is a decreasing number of user. Maybe you'll see that even though you're working very hard. But resilience and having a strong vision in what you're building, it's what gets you through. Um, and talking about the most crazy idea that I've heard, it is not really safe to talk about it here, but it's like a more like an adult entertainment on a metaverse. As a bull market, things are a bit crazy. That is the craziest idea that I've heard because apparently people that are in real life struggling with their industry um, and so they want to move to the metaverse, providing 24-7 services. So I think that would be really interesting, but um, maybe a bit later. <laughs> Great. What about you, Emma? I know you've, you've seen the cycle, you know, to and there, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, so to your first question, advice for projects in the bear market, I totally agree with what Coco was saying. Um, some of the examples are, you know, in 2018, when we come across builders, right? We like the builders, we like, the, like their, the, their vision, but we thought, okay, maybe this idea wouldn't quite work, right? And, and I, I think the probability of them succeeding if they keep on iterating and finding a product market fit is pretty high because we're going through a paradigm shift in Web3. Right? So whoever have stuck around, the chance of them succeeding is pretty high. So I feel like you, you need to kind of just keep building, keep pivoting, keep, in, keep talking to people. Uh, the second thing is finding people who trust your vision and but have complementary skill set with you, right? Because nobody can do it all. Uh, in startup, if, if you're good with sales pitching, then find someone who's technical, right, and, and vice versa, right. So I think if you have two or three core team members who can complement you and lift you up, I think that's super important. Um, and I, I don't think funding is an issue, in, even in this bear market, because I think a lot of funds have raised a lot of money in the bull market, and it's very different from 2017, 2018 where nobody was prepared for it and there was very few institutional investors. So capital just dried up. So people had a lot of troubles in, in raising funds. But uh, what I'm seeing differently in this market is there's still plenty of capital if you have good idea and good team. So at least that part, I think it's a, it's a good sign. Um, um, so to your second question, which is about craziest idea, um, I think like we, we've been long enough yeah, in, uh, we've been in crypto long enough to be, try to be open-minded because there were times where we would say, no, this would never work. And then a few months later, it has like traction, massive funding. So over and over again, we've just learned, okay, let's just try to be open-minded. Nothing's too crazy for crypto web and Web3. No, that's great. Um, Brad, turning it to you, what's, what's been your <clears throat> yeah, I mean, advice? I would echo Coco and Emma's thoughts. I mean, historically, some of the best companies in both Web 2 and Web 3 have been built in, in a bear market because you end up with kind of mission-driven founders who are excited about what they're building. They're not doing it for like a cash grab. And they tend to be a little bit scrappier. You know, when, it, when capital is a little bit harder to raise, you have to be a little more resourceful, a little scrappier. You have to iterate more to find product market fit. And I think that ends up with a more resilient, stronger company in the end. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think in terms of like the craziest thing we've seen, uh, I think I may have seen the pitch that Coco was talking about. 
Uh, <laughs> but honestly, I think a lot of times in like, you just can tell that people are just pasting together buzzwords, you know, where it's like a ZK roll up AI based metaverse wallet. And you're like, I don't know what that means, you know? <laughs> and I think, I mean, it does speak to when we talked about this, when we went through the pitch practice for Phil.vc, you know, you got to be able to coherently describe what you're doing and make sure that you're solving an actual problem. And if you can't explain it in a way that, you know, investors or potential customers can understand, then it's never going to be, it's never going to work, basically. No, I, I love that point of thought you just <laughs> brought up, um, and Brad. And so I, I would love to hear, actually, from both of you guys. How do you guys vet, uh, crypto is obviously all over the place, but it can also move very quickly. It can also be highly technical. How do you guys determine what's fake versus what's real in substance when it comes to the technology side? Because it's so easy to drop buzzwords. It's so easy to say, this is happening. We're integrating with X, Y, Z. How do you guys validate as investors? Mm -hmm. uh, I think for, because I didn't come from a programming and then computer science background, for me, first, I rely heavily on our tech team to do the tech due diligence. They are amazing. They will look at, go into their GitHub, see how active they are, look at their code line by line, at least for a few of the uh, repositories that they have, and then just to verify that, whether they can build what they are building. And second, what I think is really, really important is their CTO, just to talk to them, to talk to him and see, um, or her, to see um, what the vision is it. Uh, how is he trying to build it? Is he thinking about it long term? Does it have the ability to lead the other programmers uh, that he's going to bring into the team and then continue to build? So I think maybe at the beginning they come in even pre-product a lot of the time in the accelerator, but then we he uh, heavily focus on the existing GitHub uh, rep repositories and then also the CTO uh, comments. Amazing. Emma, what about you? I mean, crypto is moving so quickly. We, we talk about crypto moving in dog years, not human years, right? So how do you, how do you vet on the technical side what's going to stick and what's going to be something that is short-sighted? Yeah, as an as a ex-consultant, and half of our teams are either from McKinsey or BCG, so we're all kind of like consultant teams. I think we try to go back to first principle and to just try to push down to the, to the underlying principle, right, and logic, like what is it the problem they're solving for? Um, but sometimes the problem might be ahead of you know, um, sometimes you might be ahead of the timing, whether the market is ready. So also kind of try to, um, like I said, have an open mind and just kind of give a fuzzy range, right? On high level, logic level, it might work, but it might not work now. So if we took a long-term view, we should give them a chance to pivot and stuff like that. Um, also echo what um, Coco was saying on due diligence. We place, given how early we go into, so on the accelerator, we try to be the first checking to the uh, startups. And then on the VC side, we try to go into pre-seed, seed rounds. So a lot of the times the team have an idea, not even an MAP, right? So um, we place a lot of focus into founders' background. Um, you know, what have they done before with their relevant experience, right? Do they have complementary skills? Do they actually believe in what they're building or just like, not like what Brad was talking about, just threw a bunch of buzzwords together and raised 10 million? So, yeah. yeah. No, that's wonderful. And, and Brad, I'm going to turn it to you for a curveball question since you said I can ask you anything. So, what are your thoughts on the most underrated crypto market for startups today? If um, I know that you guys have been thinking on your team around different markets, um, obviously Asia is a huge one, but what are some ones that you just didn't expect that you're just like, this is ripe for disruption, this is, and, and tell us more about the characteristics that, that lead you down that thesis. Yeah, I mean, I think we look a lot for, for companies and founders that are solving problems that like abstract away some of the crypto complexity. Because right now, I mean, broadly speaking, crypto has a usability problem. And I think it's hard for developers, it's hard for like the ultimate end consumers. And so figuring out companies that can like onboard the next billion users into crypto and who want to use the underlying technology because it's the best option for them, not because they're super passionate about privacy or technology. Obviously, we can build that in. But if you want to cross the chasm, and Juan and Colin both kind of touched on this, you know, you need to get people who are using it because it's the best option for them, and it's feature, like the features are 10 to 100x better than the other available options. And so building that layer that abstracts away the complexity to allow more developers to use it 
And you know, I mean, one of the biggest advantages we have from Protocol Labs standpoint is we have 300 people who have built and launched protocols in this space. And that gives us some insight into both the problems those teams face as they scale, but also ideally kind of gaps in the market and where the market is headed. Got it. Is there like a particular region? Outer space? You're... <laughs> <laughs> we do have some satellite companies. You know, we have the interplanetary file system. So um, I think broadly, we're super excited about Asia. We're super excited to be here. You know, I think like broadly Filecoin adoption has been great here. And I think like the technology adoption has been great here. And there's a lot of capital looking to be deployed into the ecosystem here. Got it. Um, and I would love to eat each one of you guys, especially given the two of you guys are, have been very heavy in the Asia region, where are the hot markets that people have been building out of your startup networks? Um, obviously, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea. Like, tell us more about the Asia region. I know we have folks here from Asia, but um, let us know a little bit more about you know, how, how startups pick, where are the best environments to set up? Um, mm -hmm. How do you guys guide startups along those journeys, especially early, early stage ones? Mm -hmm. Um, Outlier Ventures actually very European centric because we are headquartered in London, but we're actually seeing more and more applicants from Asia, for example, like founder from Glitter, and then also we actually have a few projects from India as well. Uh, so I think right now there are a lot of builders building in India and then also in Southeast Asia, especially with what happened last year in the bull market and GameFi is really prominent uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so I do think Southeast Asia is a market that should be tapped into first because um, I think crypto just gives a great narrative of everyone can be their own custody of their own money. Uh, this is really important, especially in some more uh, developing countries, I think. Um, so I do think this is really good space and market to focus on for the coming startups in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Great. What about you, Emma? Yeah. Um, we're definitely super big on Asia. Most mm -hmm. of uh, the team members are based out of Asia. So we have people across Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Vin um, India, um, um, and even Laos. <laughs> there, there's a funny story there. So um, uh, I think for us, there's a few different, different countries, different regions brings different strength. Like we're very bullish on China, but I think because of the recent regulatory concerns, a lot of the entrepreneurs actually come over to Singapore. So it makes Singapore a very, I think, interesting space to be. And then Korea and Japan, I think those people are very, well, people over there are intrinsically more sensitive to digital assets because gaming was really big. So we're looking forward to see a lot more gaming IPs coming to this space. Um, and if you look at like India, India has probably one of the largest uh, technical talents inventory. Um, and we have a people there who so want to build a strong presence there so we can attract a lot more technical people. And you also have like flagship projects coming out from India, right? Like InstaDab, which is part of our portfolio. You have Biconomy, which came from Outlier Venture. Um, and also, I think Vietnam because Axie was there, YGG was there from the Philippines, right? So I think Southeast Asia region have a lot of like gaming developers as well, um, and also potential DeFi uh, audience. So I think we're, we're super excited and we're expecting to see like different flavor of startup coming out from different country. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's so exciting. Um, so I know we're close to the end of time, but I would love to hear um, from all of you guys on this panel a little bit about um, why decentralized finance um, for your startups? What is the big opportunity that we all came here to talk about um, as we think about Filecoin virtual machines, smart contracts, the next frontier? Where are the biggest areas that you guys have seen? And you know, it could be areas that startups that in your, each of your portfolios they're looking at. Um, but what, what does decentralized storage mean to each of you? And um, what is that opportunity that I think most people looking outside in may not necessarily think about? Um, I think decentralized storage is very important in the space because in Web2, everything is very centralized. If AWS break, then you can't retrieve your data. Or a lot of the time in centralized data, um, they can take your data and do anything with it. But then with decentralized storage, decentralized data, and I'm very big on open data economy as well, uh, we actually have the ownership of our own data. We can do a lot of thing about it ourselves instead of giving the control to other people. And then decentralized storage also ensure that uh, the data is always there and safe, that where we want it to be, and then it breaks less easily. It just. 
Amazing. Emma, what about you? I would love to kind of hear your, your yeah. thesis on. Um, so for us, we are pretty big on multi-chain. Um, and uh, obviously, we, we think Web3 being Web3, you have to basically, what differentiates Web3 from Web2 is ownership. Right, um, and what allows for true ownership is decentralized across the entire stack, and storage is so important for it. I, I can't imagine if someone owns like a half million worth of uh, board apes, and you have that stored on like AWS. No offense, but uh, I think I would be quite concerned. So I want to, I want all those valuable assets, uh, crypto native assets, to, do, to be stored on decentralized network. And I think uh, earlier Juan was talking about how Filecoin as a decentralized layer could actually be compatible and working with various other chains out there, right? You can work with Polkadot, Ethereum, uh, Avalanche, uh, you know, um, Cosmos. So I think that's super exciting. That's why we want to invest into this space because for us, we feel in the future, it's gonna be multi-chain, there's no doubt about it. And, and uh, various applications gonna flourish on top of that. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. And Brad, you're welcome to answer that question or I can throw another one your way. Um, how do we class. bring other investors along with us in the Web3 world? We were just talking about this conference next door with family offices. And so I would love, <laughs> each of you are also welcome to jump in, but Brad, when we start with you, how do we, how do we think about communicating, translating to open up the investment pool of all the exciting startups in the space? Yeah, well, first they should come to phil.vc later today. Uh, I mean, honestly, I spend a lot of my time trying to attract kind of external capital by evangelizing all of the cool things that are being built in our ecosystem. And I think understanding the breadth of opportunities that are enabled by decentralized storage is super important. And then highlighting the companies that are you know, pitching later today and showing all the cool different things that you can do that it is enabled and all the different business models that are enabled by, by Filecoin and being the underlying storage layer is a super important and the breadth of opportunities that can be built on that is, is super powerful. And I think, you know, Juan does a great job traveling the world, evangelizing and giving out the master plan. Um, and I think we rely on kind of putting the companies out front to show what is possible and enabled by Filecoin. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I would, I think we have like two, three minutes left, but would love to hear from each of you guys. How are you guys uh, thinking about bringing other groups along to open up the investment pool for your startups, for your ecosystem, for your investments. I know this is obviously, the technology space sometimes can be a black box for a lot of traditional investors. Yeah. I think um, right now we talk a lot about improving the UX of a lot of Web3 apps because it's not UX friendly. But I will also say improve the UX of the pitch because uh, people from outside Web3 space, they are not familiar with any terminology that we are having. Uh, decentralized. Uh, what is decentralization? What is DAOs? What is all these like fancy terms that we are using? People outside of the space they don't understand. So if we want to attract investors on board them, we probably need to explain it to them in also more layman terms and then try to find maybe a Web2 comparison so that they will understand it better, but then let them understand that it's a Web2, but with a lot more benefits of it being decentralized, of you having the ownership of it. Um, so I do think the UX of a pitch uh, can be improved to onboard more people. Yeah, I think there are three things uh, in my mind. The first thing, uh, like Brad was saying, right, advocacy and evangelization, because I think, um, well, things have already improved quite a bit compared to the narratives in 2017 and 2018. Now, I think a lot of uh, uh, institutional allocators have already or are starting to look actively into the space. Um, but I think given how volatile the whole market is, a lot of them still have concerns jumping in full time. They're probably tipping their toes in here. So I think a lot more ed education is needed. And second, Second thing is we need truly retail skill, like workable Web3 applications, not just for the hobbyist, right? You need, like Brad was saying, you need infrastructure to abstract away all this, I don't care what chain you're building on, right? I'm just using a decentralized app or a gaming app and, and, and all that is not there. That's why we need to invest into infrastructure. Um, and then the third thing, I think the whole market structure need to mature. Um, the regulators, the decentralized, the, the digital assets accessors, like uh, access platform, like uh, exchange wallets, all those things needs to mature to allow for, I guess, people to be able to for better differentiate good startups versus bad startups, right? So like money can be channeled into like really um, um, Web3 native startups that can change the future, yeah. 
Amazing. Yeah, Brad, any to, to last add, words? I was just going to say to add on to Emma, what Emma was saying. You know, I think one of the reasons we like to partner with the accelerator companies is they help work, they help these companies work on go to market, right? Like a lot of times you see these companies that are solving a super hard technical problem, but no one actually cares. Like you need to be able to onboard developers, build community, and you know, again, abstract away some of the complexity so that people can actually use your technology. And I think a lot of times in a super technical area like blockchain, people solve really hard technical problems, but they don't actually solve problems for the users or for the enterprise users. And so making sure that that the companies understand that they need to be able to explain the problem they're solving and make sure that people care and ultimately find like product market fit. Amazing. Well, um, it's such a treat today to have all these amazing panelists with us today. I did want to say, I think we have a few minutes left for phil.vc. If you guys want to attend, it's invite only, but definitely apply. I think Brad is still accepting um, applications. And we would love to see some of you guys in the room to learn about all the incredible startups that have come out of Outliers and Long Hash. I also wanted to share that if you guys are planning to go to Portugal later this this year, um, we have a huge event called Phil Lisbon, and then a huge presence at um, the Web Summit, which will have a ton of startups, which will have a, a ton of investors, and uh, a ton of really great builders. And so I just wanted to share that out as well. Thank you so much for joining us on this exciting panel, everyone. Thank you.